Welcome, everybody. Welcome. You know the routine, right? You first pray. God blesses the internet connection to stay strong. Fill me with the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ, to speak truth in the power of the Holy Spirit, to speak it passionately, to bless you, the people of God, to fall more passionate love with Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, the Father's beloved heart who became flesh, right? We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name. Yeah, hope of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Welcome, everybody. How you guys doing? You guys doing? You're doing, you're doing. Just got to wait for a few more faces to show up. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ for all the regulars here. You know who you are. I can't just mention every one of you because then we'll be here all night. Thank the Lord Jesus for the admins here, Protestant believer and others who helped me to help you. Thank you, Orthodox believer. I'm doing, I'm doing. Uh, I did get good news today. God is answering your prayers. So that's why, please, don't stop praying for me and fasting for me and asking your church to pray and fast. And for my daughters, good news is they accepted me. I'm going to be able to stay here for the foreseeable future in Jesus' name. Good news. Got a call saying, yep, we can stay here for the foreseeable future. Pray I don't go back, but that the Lord Jesus will bring my angels to me, right? I miss them and I love them. And, you know, still there are some trials, but God is good. Sam, do you have any advice on how to deal with family? Uh, Hapsa, no, I don't. You just... Pray and fast for them. Try to cling to Jesus Christ, cleave to Jesus Christ, hope in Jesus Christ, love Jesus Christ, worship Jesus Christ, and ask Jesus to guide you and convict them. I mean, really. Choose Jesus. You heard what I like, right? Because you said today your mom made caddy. Hater. It's got to it's gotta be not spicy, though. My favorite Assyrian food is rozet. No, not rozet. Sharwit pertope. I'm going to say the Assyrian style because you're Chaldean, you're a sellout. Sharwit Pertope. And I like Kari Riza, but not the spicy, where they got meat in or chicken with peas and Pertope, potatoes, right? But if you guys want to know what my favorite food is, let me tell you. My favorite food is pizza, especially deep dish sausage pizza. And I love chocolate, specifically, I love ice cream. And I love peanut butter ice cream or peanut butter chocolate. So, if you guys want to win my heart, especially if there are people there, if there are some beautiful sisters who love Jesus, want to win my heart, just send me some ice cream, like Reese's peanut butter ice cream, and then I'll propose. No. And Jason, I got your email. Praise Jesus Christ for your testimony. I pray the Lord Jesus will preserve you and every one of us by his spirit for his glory, right? What's up, first and last? We're just waiting for a few more faces to show up. I'm going to discuss what it means for Jesus Christ, our Lord, to be called the firstborn of all creation and God's firstborn. Okay, Justin, let's try this again. I know you're a hater and you're a born hater. Putting on weight, I've actually lost tons of weight, over 100 pounds. What weight, you little wicked hater? What's wrong with you, bro? The weight I lost, you gained. That's why you're single and no one's going to marry you. Okay, I'm a hater, dude. Can't you tell from my face, guys, I've gotten skinnier? Thank God. You get a hater, dude. I'm a hater, man. I mean, jealous. people are jealous. What are you going to do? God bless you too, Revelation 22, 13. Yes, sure you're kidding. You're just a hater, right? That is Cabello. Be careful of Cabello. That's a dangerous person right there. What's up, Equip Apologetics? Nick, 1611, on his way to heaven. We're going to start in a few minutes. Let me actually start in prayer. Wow, Lisa, you got me handsome with ice cream. I'll make you. Man, what's going on? These past two days, people are calling me handsome. What's up? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I don't know, man. But hey, it's funny, right? But anyway, even with my coffee stained teeth. Now, Angela, when your husband lost it, who found it? He lost 87 pounds. Did someone else find it? Levy. What is your fascination with where I'm living right now? You kept asking last time. Do you want to get blocked? What, do you want to hunt me down? How about if I give you my social security? Why don't you tell me where you live so I can pay you a visit? Gubrak, thank you. Another confirmation. I got someone else saying I'm handsome. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if it's a brother or sister. Okay. Anyway. Let's begin in prayer. Let's ask the Lord. Okay. Uh, 
Levi, I, 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 I'm, I'm confused why you would come here and egg me on thinking you're going to last in my channel. Let me, let, let's try this again. I'm going to be very nice and gentle. You don't come here asking me where I live. If I want you, want you to know where I live, I will share it. And if you're saying that's harsh, why are you here, brother? Why are you in my channel? I don't think you've heard enough of my videos to say. I'm okay with people not coming to my channel because let me repeat it again like a broken record so we can begin in prayer. I get a lot of complaints. I've had people tell me, you waste too much time on these side distractions and then you're harsh with people and then we can't listen to you anymore. I've had few people tell me that, you know, okay. Let me just say it again because I don't want to sound like a broken record. Brother, I understand. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm not going to draw everyone to my teaching because I have a personality that not everyone is going to like. I'm going to offend people. People are going to despise me. I understand that. And in those areas of my personality that are not pleasing to Jesus Christ, I beg and I beseech the Holy Spirit, our God, our Lord, our love, our life, because the Holy Spirit is our God. He's our creator, our sustainer, savior, redeemer, preserver, and our perfect teacher. Transform me to become more like Jesus and deliver me from those imperfections. But until that happens, God in his infinite wisdom and his infinite knowledge and power and his beauty has raised up a variety of Christian teachers, preachers, apologists, because no one person is going to draw everyone to himself, and God doesn't want that to happen. Okay, let me let me explain. Let me show you the wisdom of God. God doesn't want any one human teacher to be the center of attention, the focus, so that everyone looks to him, so that that person doesn't become puffed up and people depend on him. Because we depend on the triune God and completely trust and depend on the triune God and love and hope in the triune God perfectly, unconditionally, completely. That's the goal. So the triune God raises up imperfect human vessels to teach the body of believers so that no one human teacher has all the gifts, has all the talents, and draws everyone to himself and becomes the center of attention. See, that's what's amazing about God, how beautiful, majestic, and wise he is that he's done it this way. So I'm not going to draw everybody. People are going to, there's people who can't stand me. And even people who, who say they're Christian, who then uh, email me, see, see, you see, that's God judgment on you, brother. God is disciplining you because you're a wicked dog. That's why your ex-wife left you and had an affair on you. That's why you're homeless. I've had people say that to me because they can't stand me in my personality. Right? You with me there? Yeah, I've had it. They've come here and said it to me. They've sent me emails. One, Alexander Coppersmith, one filthy, wicked son of Satan, one filthy dog would hunt me on my Facebook pages. See, God disciplined you. That Where's your wife now, right? Even earlier today, even earlier today, earlier today, I was on Michael Brown's channel, and I think they were Mohammedans, lovers of Muhammad. Blackstone kissers, or they may have been Christians who hate me, were telling me, yeah, 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 who's now? And I'm sorry to say this, you know, banging your wife. Sorry for the direct language. No, those people that attacked me were Christian Orthodox because we do have Christians who can be nasty and vile and wicked. That doesn't mean they're not Christians because, remember, we Christians are imperfect, fallen human vessels who are being transformed, healed by the Holy Spirit daily to become more like Jesus Christ, right? So what's my point? Okay, what's my point? I'm not going to draw everyone because people can't stand my personality. That's okay. I'm Honestly, I'm okay. I'm okay with it. There are people who love David Wood. There are people who hate David Wood. There are people who love... Christian prince and people hate Christian prince because they don't think he's being Christ-like, right? And listen, I'm going to tell you. I know you've heard me criticize this brother and get angry with this brother and even say some very harsh things about this brother, but I want to be upfront with you. Can I be upfront with you? Can I be upfront with you guys? All right. I actually. 
from my heart, from my heart, I know some of you may not like him and some of you love him, but I actually, from my heart, love James White. Andrew, you didn't miss anything. I just started. I love him. I love the brother. He was one of the biggest influences in my Christian life early on. And my anger towards him, my lashing out towards, uh, lashing out at him, criticizing him, and sometimes, and I'm ashamed to say it, harsh manner, is out of my intense love for him, right? Have you ever heard, have you ever heard that saying, you know, that, in fact, someone was telling me that about, you know, my ex-wife, that you can be so madly in love with someone that that love turns to extreme anger and hate because of disappointment towards that person, right? Have you heard that saying? They say so. I mean, I'm I'm giving you the gist of it that, you know, you can fall so madly in love with someone that that love turns into such extreme anger and hatred towards that person because you love them so much, right? And I, and I love James White. I do. I love the brother. Right? I love the brother. And I pray in Jesus' name, God preserve him. God bless him. God protect him. Seal him by the Spirit so that he never falls, that he seals me and David Wood and Christian Prince and Robert Spencer and Anthony Rogers, all of us in the ministry that by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ covering us, we never fall and shame the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So my, my whole point is, I may not be for you. There's someone there God has raised up that God will use to speak to your heart and bless you. I may not be that one. Because my personality doesn't sit well with many people. So, Levi, you don't like my personality. I'm not going to be offended that you don't return. Okay? I'm not going to be offended. But if you're going to press me and ask me where I live, don't be surprised. I block you. If I want to know, if I want people to know where I live, I'll tell them. So stop pestering me. Because the other day you did, I, you don't you don't think I was reading your comments. Where does, where does Sam live now? Where does... Why don't I just give you my social security? You want me to give you my social security? Here, better yet, I'll give you my ex-wife's address. How about that? Because if you're one of these crazy stalkers, God forbid, I'm just kidding because I don't want someone to listen to this say that I'm sending people my ex-wife. Just kidding. It's a joke. May the Lord Jesus preserve her, convict her to repent, and make her on fire for Jesus because she is the mother of my angels. Okay. Okay, guys, pray for the internet connection. Pray for the internet connection. Stay strong. Let's begin in prayer. You are the deepest anti-Trinitarian apologist. I have no idea what you mean. Anti-Trinitarian apologist means what? I'm against the Trinity. So, Daryl Nutt, I like your last name because sometimes your last name perfectly describes you. It's an apt description of you. You are a nut. How in the world am I an anti-Trinitarian? This guy's crazy, dude. The guy's crazy, right? Anti-Trinitarian? That means I'm an apologist against the Trinity. Yeah. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. All right. Anyway, pray for the internet connection. I'm as to the router as possible. Okay. Okay. Let's pray, please, guys, because I have no control of the internet connection, right? We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you for who you are, my God, because you are God. And that's enough to make you worthy of all praise and love and glory and honor because of who you are, not simply because of what you've done. And we praise you, Father. We praise your Son, the Lord Jesus, your very heart who became flesh. And we praise your Holy Spirit. And, Father, I ask that you bless this session as you've done all previous sessions, Father. Fill us, not just me, everyone present. And please fill our loved ones. My case, my two angels, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Seal us by your Holy Spirit. Anoint us by your Holy Spirit. Fill us with fruit from your Holy Spirit. Power from your Holy Spirit. Life from your Holy Spirit. Love from your Holy Spirit, Father. And Father, wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Cover us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And wash my daughters and cover them in the blood of Jesus. And everyone's loved ones here who need to be covered by the blood of Jesus, Father. Fill my throat my lungs, my chest with the breath of life and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. Please, my God, save me from error, stammering confusion, 
enable me to recall scriptures and interpret them perfectly and correctly and give us depth and wisdom and knowledge, insight into your word, to stand in awe of your word, because your word is your voice, so we can be in awe of you and make us more like Jesus and save us from distractions of the enemy. Please, Father, have your way. We love you, Abba. Because of Jesus, we can call you Abba. We can call you Baba. I can even say Bobby. Bobby, you are my father because of Jesus. You are our father. Each one of us can say to you, Bobby, my father, because of Jesus, because of your spirit that you gave us. We love you, Abba. Bobby, we love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We're in love with you. We love you, and we need you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name. Okay, I'm going to try to finish today's discussion. I mean, when I say today's discussion, I'm going to try to finish where I left off yesterday. I was trying to explain what it means for our Lord Jesus Christ to be called the firstborn. So you really need to listen to yesterday's session because I'm going to proceed from where I left off. I'm going to build on the foundation I laid yesterday. Fadi Hanun. Pray that God will sanctify my heart, that it's from my heart, filled with love from the Spirit. Right? Right? And, and it moves me too. You know why? It moves me too. You okay? It, uh, it moves me too. I'll tell you why it moves me. If you go to Mark 14, let's look at it. Let's go to Mark 14. Let's read 36 to 38. Let me show you something. Let me show you some before I begin. Mark 14, 36 to 38. Well, Michelle, if I have a beautiful heart, that's because the trying God is beauty, infinite beauty. All beauty is from the trying God. And this heart <clears throat> was made beautiful by the trying God. So the Father, Son, and Spirit gets all glory. Now watch here. Mark 14, 36 to 38. Pay attention to 36, folks. And he said, Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. I won't read 37, 38, but I want you to read 36. Jesus in Aramaic calls God Abba. Abba. That would be the Aramaic way. I know there are some scholars who contest it, which I really don't care what scholars contest. They say that Abba is... An Aramaic term that means more than simply father. It's a very intimate way of saying daddy, right? Abba, daddy, my, my daddy, right? Now, here's what's beautiful about Jesus Christ. Here's what's beautiful about the Father. Here's what's beautiful about the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, because he is truly the essential, the eternal son of God, right? And because of his infinite love, he has redeemed us to share in his sonship. Because we are one with Jesus in the spirit. We share in his sonship. He's given us the right to call God Abba. Here, let's go to Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6. Yep, Franz Toma, he speaks Assyrian. He gets it. Those who are from Aramaic-speaking backgrounds, Assyrians, Chaldeans, they get it. But Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6. But when the full limit of the time arrived, pay attention here, folks, read. But when the full limit of the time arrived, God sent his son, who was born of a woman and who was under law. I guess he's quoting neural translation. That's fine, because we're going to use the Joe Witness Bible against them. So thank you, Protestant believer, for serving us. And thank you, admins, for helping me to help the brethren. That he might release by purchase those under law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now pay attention to verse 6. Now, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, and it cries out, Abba, Father. The spirit of Jesus unites us to Jesus, the Holy Spirit that belongs to Jesus and the Father. Unites us to Jesus, making us one with him spiritually, and thereby sharing in his sonship. And just like Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ called God Abba, because we are one with Jesus, born of the spirit of Jesus, we can call God Abba, Father. Now, notice Levi, what he's trying to do, appeal to emotion and try to make me feel guilty. This is why this guy's not going to last. Watch here. Look at, look, at, look at how pathetic this appeal is. Watch here. 
It's okay, Sam. I wasn't pre pressuring you. I'm a pastor in the church where I serve the Lord as congregation all over the country. So I was just asking because I honestly felt like helping you. You see, you see how dirty that is? He thinks he thinks he's being Christ-like. You see, this is what we call the carrot and stick. You see, Sam, I was just trying to help you because I got a congregation all over the world that people can help you. See, so if you were just a little nicer, you need, you know, Levy, you need to go. You know that, right, brother? The worst thing you can do is your use your position. Use your position, right, to try to win me over or to basically say, you know what? You're lost. Okay, send our friend on his merry way. Angela, you're very naive, sister. You are so naive, it actually makes me want to cry. You think he was being very kind-hearted? You serious? Okay. Okay, now, coming back here. That's why France, uh, they need to be Assyrians because we Assyrians were cunning and conniving, but we're saved by the Spirit. We know when someone's trying to tickle us for the kill, right? Butter us up for the kill. Yeah. I wasn't born yesterday, folks. I was born the day before. Not yesterday, but the day before. So I know when someone's trying to, it's okay, fam. I got a huge congregation and I got believers everywhere. See, if you were just a little nice, I could have helped you, really. So you need me. You need me because I am Jesus' answer to your prayers. <laughs> you know, I got mental issues, right? And so the guy just texts me. Unbelievable. All right. Okay. Okay, brother. Yeah, he just texted me. So as a guy who's asthma phone, unbelievable. Okay, let's come back to issues. Sorry for these distractions. Rebuke them in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, he, because he's, he needs attention. This is, you know, he has emotional and mental issues because he needs attention. He thrives off of it. And, and I'm not trying to put people down. In the body of Christ, you have people who are damaged and need healing. And so you're going to have people who struggle with the need to be heard because we're broken vessels and the spirit heals us. This is a fact. I'm not putting anyone down, right? It's just a fact. God has called sick people to his spiritual hospital called the church in order that our great physician, Jesus Christ, heals us by the spirit. So you're going to find sick people who need attention and affirmation because they're damaged. And that's what this guy's doing. May the Lord have mercy on him. Yeah, exactly. Andrew Martin just mentioned it. David Wood. So don't be surprised that you're going to find sick people in the church. Because after all, Jesus said that he didn't call, came to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And it is not the whole that need a physician but the sick. So Jesus is telling you, I am the great physician who come to heal the spiritually sick. So what do you expect to find in ho a hospital? Sick people. Since the church is a spiritual hospital, expect to find... Spiritually sick people, people with a variety of issues, emotional, mental, physical, psychological, you name it, right? Okay. You with me there? Okay, so coming back to this issue, my, my oldest brother's there saying I don't, the guy who's better looking than me. Coming back to this issue, okay. Do you see in Galatians 4, 4 to 6, it says, because of the spirit of Christ in us, we are one with Christ in the spirit, and we share in Jesus' sonship. And just like the historical Jesus called God Abba, did you see what Paul said in Galatians 4, 6? We have the right because of Jesus to call God Abba. You know what that means? You understand what you're reading in these passages? You understand what you're reading in these passages? Because of the love of the triune God, because God is a father by nature. And Jesus is the eternal son, the essential eternal son of God. And because of the spirit of the father and the son goes about creation to produce spiritual families that belong to God. We now have been given the authority to say to God, daddy. And if you speak Assyrian, you have now been given the authority. You Assyrian, Chaldean speakers, you can call God. Bobby, Baba. You know why that moves my heart? Can I tell you why that moves my heart? 
One thing I appreciate that my ex-wife did. She taught my daughters to call me Baba in the Assyrian language. So you know what was the most delightful thing first thing in the morning and the most delightful thing at night? My daughters, my angels, would call me Baba. They go, Baba, right? Bobby. And they'd run up to me and hug me. I haven't heard that in a while. I haven't heard my angels' voices, right? Call me Abba. I'm Baba. Sorry. God is good. We live in a fallen world, a broken world. And one thing that makes Jesus beautiful, you know what makes him beautiful? Let me tell you what makes Jesus beautiful. He tells it like it is. He tells it like it is. And he doesn't lie to us because Jesus can't lie. You know what he said? He goes, in this world, you're going to have trials. But do not be afraid. I have overcome the world. And so when we go through trials, and my trials are nothing. Shame on me if I complain. I got brothers and sisters in Christ who are tortured, raped, beaten, murdered, enslaved in prison. And they still worship Jesus. But what makes it beautiful is I've been told by Jesus I'm going to go through trials. And so when I go through trials, they're not in discouragement. They actually confirm the truth of the Bible and the honesty, integrity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Because he doesn't lie. The master did not lie. Our Lord did not lie. He said, hey, if you want to follow me, deny yourself and carry the cross daily. Right? You have to deny yourself and carry the cross daily. And the cross was one of the most painful ways one of the most painful ways to die. Okay. Now, okay, now, why are we getting into some side talks? I guess you guys don't know the rules of this channel. I see that there's side talk. Merrick and Orthodox Believer are getting into fights, arguments about communion of the saints. Uh, one of you is going to be blocked. Let's see which one of you is going to get blocked. Because I guess no matter how many times I repeat myself like a broken record, I keep saying, do not engage in side issues that are not relevant to the topic. But it seems like my own Christian brothers and sisters have no respect for me. So, Merrick, if you're the one who started it, you know you're going to get blocked. Yeah, because Orthodox believer is upset. He just said, we don't pray to her, stop lying. So, Andrew, they are arguing because notice the reaction of Orthodox believer. So I want to know if Merrick started it. Orthodox, who started it? Did you start it or did Merrick did? And see, again, Merrick was trying to butter me up too, saying that Merrick wants to support me. Guys, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I truly appreciate, appreciate it from my heart, from my heart, that there are brothers and sisters who want to support me financially because I'm in full-time ministry. But don't you think for a moment, moment that because of your financial support, you're going to manipulate me and make me jump through hoops, uh, hoops? God forbid. May Jesus never allow it to happen by the power of the Spirit, that I prostitute myself for money. God forbid, Lord Jesus, save me from that. Okay? If you guys continue to disrespect the rules, I'm going to start blocking you guys. Are you with me there? Why would you engage in a side discussion about communion of the saints? Why would you do that? Do you see the title? Jehovah's Witnesses and Jesus is God's firstborn. Why would you, Riaz, you've been here long enough, bring up the issue of the intercession of the Blessed Mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Of anyone who would know better, it's you. Why did you do that? Why would you ask an Orthodox believer about something you know they engage in and something I've already discussed in previous sessions? I'm not blaming you, Orthodox believer. They should have known better than, than to ask you. And I did a series on it, by the way. It's on my YouTube channel. Communion of the Saints. I did a multi-part series that got me in trouble with some Protestants. So why would you bring it up to someone when you know I've already addressed the issue? Unless you want to start a debate and division. So why would you do that? Again, pray for me. To never, ever prostitute myself for money. God forbid, may the blood of Jesus be my shield. The Holy Spirit seal me. 
that I never prostitute myself for money and jump through hoops just because someone is supporting me financially to be a man of integrity till the end, right? And this is what, again, by the way, let me tell you something. That's one of this, James White's strong points. One thing I, I truly respect the brother for and love the brother for, he will not compromise his convictions. He will not back down on a position that he's thoroughly convinced of, even if it means he lose supporters and invitation to churches. Kudos to him. May God strengthen him in that conviction. All right? I pray I can be that kind of man of integrity. Because it's very easy to go there out of compromise when you struggle financially. Listen, folks. If you want to get rich, ministry is not the way to do it. You do ministry because the Holy Spirit has called you to do ministry, and he sustains you by the grace of God. Because unless you're a Ravi Zacharias or some other big name that God has graced you to bring in droves of money, you're going to struggle financially in this work, and you're going to be have to find a godly woman who understands that and is willing to partner with you anyway because it's about the kingdom of Christ. Right? So you pray for us, pray for David Wood and, and pray for Christian Prince and pray for Osama Doc Dok and pray for James White, pray for all of us that we never ever prostitute ourselves for money and compromise, God forbid, Lord, please protect us because we're no, we're no better than... The okay. I don't want to begin my sessions with 30-minute rants. Okay? I want to be able to begin a session where I can just dive into the session and not the distractions. Stop talking about issues not related to the subject, right? Because Riaz Qureshi knew better and Merrick knew better because they knew Orthodox believer believes in the communion of saints. And for the record, I do as well. And I gave the biblical basis for it. And I'm not a Catholic. I'm not orth Orthodox. I'm a Biblicist. So you knew if you asked this person this question, you're going to engage them in a debate. Why did you do it? All right. Hopefully we're not going to get any more distractions. Like I said, I'm going to repeat it again. Please don't make me repeat myself one more time. Okay. This channel is not going to be for everyone. Even though I'd like to see a thousand people come to my live stream like Christian Prince and David, because I want more people to learn. Not everyone is going to be able to handle this style of teaching. I understand this. And I'm not here to tickle ears. I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive, but I'm not here to tickle ears. And if you get on a line, I will block you. I will make it easy for you not to come back. I hope that's clear. Now, with that distraction, oh, my goodness. Hold on a second. Hello, Jamie. I'm good. Yeah, I'm actually doing a live stream. So as I'm talking to you, I'm live on YouTube. Yeah, no, that was just calling because uh, uh, I wanted to know because a friend of mine told me that there was an amendment made on October 31st from my ex. For what? No, call me back anytime because I'm hoping it's because, listen, I don't live in Illinois anymore. You know that, right? Yeah, I'm gone, so I'm not coming back. So if you can let me know, call me back. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, pray for good news. Sorry, this was something I had to pick up again. Pray God saves me from this corrupt legal system. Well, hi, ironic. Look at all the satanic distractions from guys. Right when I am begin... I get the call. I didn't get it earlier, but that's that's how Satan works. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the blood of Christ be my shield and protect me because, like I said, I'm not out of the woods. Now, with that said, and by the way, I'm going to get a call back again. I'm going to get a call back again, so I may have to interrupt the session temporarily. Okay. Anyway, with that said, let's begin. First of all, I want to first explain... I want to first explain what it means for Jesus Christ to be called the Word of God and the wisdom of God, because someone had brought up a good question. Since the wisdom of God is an attribute, 
Does that mean we can call Jesus the attribute of God because he's called the wisdom of God? Everyone with me? You understand the question? Since, if you remember yesterday's session, I demonstrated that the Lord Jesus Christ is called the power of God and the wisdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 1, 24. And Jesus basically identifies himself as the wisdom of God. And then you go to John chapter 1, right? John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, 1, and Revelation 19, 13. There Jesus is said to be the word that was with God, the word of life, and the word of God. In John chapter 1, he's called the word. In 1 John chapter 1, 1, he's called the word of life. And Revelation 19, 13, Revelation 19, 13, he's called the word of God. Okay. Since wisdom and power are attributes of God, does that mean Jesus happens to be attributes of God so that though he's an attribute, he's actually at the same time a person? This actually misunderstands the use of these expressions in reference to Christ. Okay. Are you ready for me to break it down a little bit? Lisa, may the Lord bless you for your love and appreciation. Okay. Let me break it down. First of all, let's go to John 14, verses 23 to 24, and pay attention to verse 24. Let me explain what it means for Jesus to be called the Word of God or the wisdom of God and what it, what th these titles mean and they do not mean. Okay, Revelation, uh, John 14, 23, 24. In answer, Jesus said to him, If anyone loves me, he will observe my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Now pay attention to 24. Whoever does not love me does not observe my words. The word that you are hearing is not mine, but belongs to the Father who sent me. The word that you are hearing, buffering, sorry about that. The word that you are hearing is not mine, right? The word that you are hearing is not mine, but belongs to the Father who sent me. Now, how can Jesus be speaking the word of the Father if he is the word of the Father? Did you notice the distinction? Jesus communicates the words he receives from the Father. So the Father, when he speaks to the Son, he uses words. Those words, Jesus conveys to us. Yeah, hit the like button. Okay. Are you with me there? So if God the Father uses words to communicate to Jesus, and Jesus passes those words on to us, then how can he be the Word of God? Because when we call Jesus the Word of God, we're not saying that Jesus is the audible voice of the Father or the words that the Father uses and forms, you know, sentences with. Okay, that's not what we mean. We mean Jesus is the Word of God in that he's the revelation of God. It is simply a metaphorical way of saying it is the role of Jesus to reveal God to us because you use your word to communicate. So if I want to communicate to you, I have to use words, form sentences to communicate. So this is simply a metaphorical way of saying when the Father wants to make himself known to us, he does so by sending the Son to reveal the Father to us in union with the Holy Spirit. In other words, if someone tells you, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Word of God? He's not literally the Word in the sense that when God the Father speaks audibly, and you hear words form, those words are Jesus forming to make a sentence. With me there? Are you with me there? Then what does it mean? It means that the Father sends the Son to reveal God to mankind. It's simply a metaphorical way of saying, here is the revelation of God. When God wants mankind to know who he is, he sends the Son to reveal God to us, and Jesus does that with the Holy Spirit, in union with the Holy Spirit. Okay, now let me prove that to you. Are you ready? That this is the definition. Are you ready now for the proof? The biblical proof. Okay. John 1, 18. John 1, 18. No, see, again, equipment apologetics, you're taking that to be literally the voice. It's a metaphorical way of saying that Jesus is the one who communicates to us 
on behalf of the Father, right? That too is a metaphorical description of Jesus in the garden, right? Because if Jesus is literally the voice of God, then when God speaks to Jesus, is he using Jesus to speak to Jesus? Because when Jesus says, for example, in John 12, 28 to 30, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven says, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. If Jesus is literally the voice of God, was that Jesus that we heard or they heard speaking from heaven? Here, let me explain what I mean. Go to John 12, 28 to 30. John 12, 28 to 30. You see why it's important to understand the terms, the expressions, the language of Scripture? To know when something is metaphorical or symbolic? Okay, let me prove it to you. John 12, 28 to 30. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. Well, if Jesus is literally the voice of God, is that Jesus coming out of heaven? I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was standing there heard it and began to say that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, the voice has occurred, not for my sake, but for your sake. So how can Jesus literally be the voice of the Father or literally be the word of the Father? When right here, Jesus on earth and a voice is heard audibly from heaven. That voice is not Jesus. That voice is the Father speaking using words. You with me there? Did it make sense? Luke 9, 34 to 35. Luke 9, 34 to 35. Luke 9, 34 to 35. Okay, watch here. Yes, Nate. He's the spokesperson for God the Father. Exactly, Nate. Luke 9, 34, 35. But as he was saying these things, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. As they entered into the cloud, they became afraid. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, the one who has been chosen. Listen to him. Wait, that's the voice of the father. But Jesus is standing there and the voice is speaking about who the son is. So is that voice Jesus speaking about Jesus? Or is that voice distinct from Jesus? It's the voice of the father who used words. And those words formed a sentence identifying who Jesus is in relationship to him. You with me there? So the words that that voice used, that wasn't Jesus. The voice that they heard, that wasn't Jesus. That's the Father's distinct voice, which distinguishes him from the Son. And the words that he used to form the sentence those words are not Jesus the word. Exactly, friends. Are you getting it or no? So then here you see that Jesus isn't literally the audible voice of God the Father or the literal word of the Father. These expressions are metaphors telling us something about Jesus. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the voice or the word of God? John 1, 18. Well, Andrew Martin, keep thinking about it. If the Father's voice was heard talking about the Son, then is Jesus literally the voice of God? That when God speaks, it's Jesus who comes out. Okay. What does John 1, 12 have to do with it? I mean, earlier we're talking about, yeah, being children of God. That he, whoever believed in him, he gave them the right to be children of God. John 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who's at the Father's son side is the one who has explained them. There it goes. You got it right there. You, you pay attention? They we're using New World Translation. They butcher the Greek, but that's fine. Notice it says, the Son explains God the Father. I'm not going to explain John 3.13 why, why, why I'm. Don't ask me about a passage that's not directly related to my point, please. Did you see what it means for Jesus to be the Word? Verse 18 tells you. Verse 18 tells you that Jesus is the word and that he's the one who explains God to us. 
Because you use your words to communicate. You use your words to reveal yourself. Because if I'm silent, you won't know who I am. If I walk in a place and I say nothing, you're not, you're not going to know who I am. But the moment I open my mouth and I use words to form sentences, then you get to know me. This is what it means for Jesus to be the word of God. He's not literally the word. It's a metaphorical expression denoting the fact that Jesus is the one whom the Father sends to explain God to creation. And Jesus does that in union with the Holy Spirit. Exactly, Riaz. You got it there? Let's go to John 17, verse 6 and 26. John 17, verse 6 and 26. I have made your name manifest to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have observed your word. Now pay attention. I have made your name manifest to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have observed your word. So notice, I made your name manifest to them, and they observe your word. Now 26. I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in union with them. Okay. Pay attention here. Pay attention here. Jesus says, I have made your name manifest to them. I have made your name known to them, will continue to make it known to them, and they've kept your word. Obviously, when he says they kept your word, they're not, he's not saying they kept me. They kept your commands, which I revealed to them. Thank you, YM. Okay, now, can I ask you a question? When Jesus says, I have made your name manifest to them, the apostles already knew what God's name happened to be. They knew his name as Yahovah, Jehovah. So what does Jesus mean when he says, pay attention, Susie, we're using the Jehovah's Witness Bible against them. Don't get confused, focus. What does it mean for Jesus to say, I've made your name known to them, I've made your name manifest to them, when they already knew that the name of God is Jehovah. What does that mean? What did he mean here? What does that mean? Someone help me. What does it mean? When you speak of the name of God, he means, I have revealed your nature to them. I have revealed your essence to them. I have revealed your characteristics to them. Name in the biblical understanding doesn't simply mean your name, like Tom. It means your character, your nature, your essence, your authority. So basically what Jesus is saying is, I have revealed who you are to them. I have given them the perfect revelation of who you are and what you're like. You catch it? So what does it mean for Jesus to be the word of God? It means he is the one who reveals the character of God, the nature of God, what God is like, who God is perfectly and completely because he happens to be fully God and one with the Father. But he does it in union with the Holy Spirit. He does it in union with the Holy Spirit. That's why all throughout the Gospels, you'll find Jesus is working in union with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is upon him and in him and working with him. And then Jesus says, when I go, the Holy Spirit will come and continue this revelation of who God is. Let's go to John 6, 44, 46. John 6, 44 to 46. Exactly, Andrew Martin, everyone else. John 6, 44 to 46. Pray for good news. This is now dampening my spirit in Jesus' name. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will resurrect him on the last day. Now pay attention. Notice what Jesus quotes, and notice what Jesus says, how God fulfills this Old Testament promise. 
45, 46. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. It doesn't say Jehovah. The New World Perversion of the Bible inserted the word Jehovah, but that's okay. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to the Father and has learned comes to me. Not that any man has seen the Father except the one who's from God. This one has seen the Father. You see what he's saying? The prophets have taught God will personally teach everyone who he is. Every man will be taught by God. And so Jesus says, this is how the scripture is fulfilled. When the father wants to teach you about who he is, he brings you to the son because only the son has full, perfect comprehension of who and what God is. No, friends, you're not getting it either. Who told you they only had the law in the Old Testament? France, you're so way off. It's hurting me, brother. Even in the Old Testament, it was Jesus who was appearing to them and making God known. You didn't pay attention to John 1, 18, friends. Don't ever do that again. Don't ever make the mistake of assuming that in the Old Testament, they didn't have the revelation of Christ. They only had the law. Bad exegesis, man. That's eisegesis. Let me read John 1, 18 one more time for because you didn't pay attention. John 1, 18. Now, as we go to John 1, 18, did you understand what Jesus just said? Do you understand? He said, the prophets have promised a time in which God will teach everyone who he is. And then Jesus says, this is how the Father fulfills it. He brings people to me because I'm the only one who has full comprehension of what the Father's like. So I alone am capable of making him known to others. Exactly, King of Kings. If you ask God, show me who you are, he reveals Jesus to you, and Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, makes God known to you. Exactly, King of Kings. Okay, John 1, 18, one more time. Francis, this is where you didn't pay attention. You didn't pay attention, John 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time. Okay, now, France, any time means even the time of the Old Testament. Even during the time of the Old Testament, no prophet could see God, meaning perceive God, understand God. I've already done sessions on what it means to see God. Go watch my sessions on this. The Greek word here doesn't mean see with the eye. It means see with the mind's eye, perceive with your mind. No one has understood or perceived what God is like at any time apart from the only begotten son. So how could Abraham have known God? Isaac have known God. Jacob have known God. Moses have known God apart from the son. They couldn't, which is why the New Testament says all of them knew God because the son made him known. John 8, 56. John 8, 56. John 8, 56. I think I'm going to have to do part three. Abraham, your father, rejoiced greatly at the prospect of seeing my day. He saw it and rejoiced. Okay, so you, did you catch it now, friends? Even Abraham eagerly desired to see Jesus Christ, and he saw Jesus Christ and was overjoyed. And that's why the Jews in 57 and 58 said, you're not yet 50 years old, yet you've seen Abraham? And then Jesus responded, Truly, true, I say to you, before Abraham came into being, I am, which the New World Translation says, I have been. What's his point? Don't let my physical appearance mislead you. I'm much older than 50. I'm so old that I've been around even before Abraham came into being because I've always existed. So, yes, I saw Abraham and Abraham saw me. You want me there? Did you catch it? Now, let me prove to you that in the Old Testament, it was Jesus that appeared to the prophets, the patriarchs. And I'm not saying that Jesus alone, even when the Father appeared, he did so in union with the Son.
Now, go back to my previous sessions. I did several talks on this, on what does it mean that you cannot see God? I went in depth. I can't repeat it. This is why I'm telling you guys, you need to go back, watch the video sessions I've done over the last couple of years. It wasn't too long ago. I did a multi-part series just a couple of months ago on what it means that you cannot see God. I went through this in depth. But here, you remember what John 1 said? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So Jesus is the word of God, right? And John 1.18 says, No one has ever comprehended God apart from the only begotten God, the only begotten Son, making him known, right? Right? You guys got it, right? John 1. Jesus is the word that was with God in the beginning, and no one has seen God at any time, even at Abraham's time, apart from the only begotten Son, making him known. So when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses saw God and knew God and had a relationship with God, that's because of the word. That's because of Jesus appearing to them. Let me prove it to you. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6. After this, the word of Jehovah came to Abraham in a vision saying, let's see if you catch it. After this, the word of Jehovah came to Abraham in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abraham. I am a shield for you. Your reward will be very great. Abraham replied, Sovereign Lord Jehovah, what will you give me seeing that I continue childless and the one who will inherit my house is a man of Damascus, Eliezer? Abraham added, You have given me no offspring and a member of my household is succeeding me as heir. But look, Jehovah's word in reply to him was, the man will not succeed you as heir, but your own son will succeed you as heir. Now notice 5 and 6. Notice 5 and 6. He now brought him outside. Notice, this is a visible appearance, a visible manifestation of Jehovah God. He's appearing visibly in time and space. How do I know? Because it says he brought him outside, meaning that Jehovah is inside the tent where Abraham is. He appears to Abraham inside the tent, and he says, come out, Abraham. Come out of your tent. I want to show you something. Pay attention, verse 5. Now brought him outside and said, look up, please, to the heavens and count the stars if you are able to do so. Then he said to him, so your offspring will become. And he put faith in Jehovah, and he counted to him as righteousness. Okay, now. Now, Susan Baker, my sister, if you were paying attention a few minutes earlier, I said, we're quoting the Jehovah's Witness Bible to use it against them. So why would you be confused as to what translation we're using and that you haven't seen another translation using lowercase g? When I made it clear, we're using the Jehovah's Witness Bible. This is why you guys need to do a better job of listening. You're really going to miss out if you don't listen and distract others. Okay, now pay attention here. Who appeared to Abraham in the tent? Who appeared visibly in the tent and spoke to Abraham face to face? Who? You just read it in verses 1 and 4. Heather, if you can show me the word Jesus there, I'll give you a million bucks. Protestant believer dropped the ball. Everyone got it, except Protestant believer and a few others. Let's post Genesis 15, 1 and 4 again. Genesis 15, verse 1 and 4 again. Irene, you dropped the ball too. It's okay, sister. This is why we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature. No toothpaste. It's not the father. No toothpaste. You're wrong. Don't pontificate. Please and learn. After this, the word of Jehovah came to Abram. See, toothpaste, because you're wrong, it says the word of Jehovah came. You're going to get blocked now. Send toothpaste back to brush his teeth. Get him out of here. You see Genesis 15, verse 1 and 6 and 4? Read Genesis 15, verse 1 and 4. The word of Jehovah came to Abraham saying, one more time, Genesis 15, verse 1 and 6. I don't tolerate chiefs here. Genesis 15, verse 1 and 6. I'm uh, 4. I'm sorry. In Jesus' name, 4. Verse 1 and 4. Verse 1 and 4. Pay attention. After this, the word of Jehovah came to Abraham in a vision, saying, 
But look, Jehovah's word in reply to him was, oh, the word of Jehovah, Jehovah's word is speaking to him. The word of Jehovah, Jehovah's word is appearing to him. Hmm. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh later in time. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, the only begotten son, who's in the bosom of the father has revealed him. And see, here you have the word of Jehovah appearing to Abraham, visibly in a tent and speaking to Abraham. And Abraham is trusting in the word of Jehovah, that word who later became the man Christ Jesus. No wonder Jesus said Abraham wanted to see me and saw me. Folks, for you who are saying it's amazing, this means that I need to repeat what I've been saying for months and years. You will not recall this information. You will not absorb this information. You won't be able to use this information if you don't go back and re-listen and re-re-listen to these sessions until it becomes second nature. Because just a few months ago, I went in depth on what it means for someone not to see God. And in those sessions, I showed these very passages where Jesus, the word is appearing to Abraham and to Samuel and to others. But you're not going to do yourself a favor if you don't go back and listen more than once, understand the arguments and use them in your witness and share it with others. Okay. Everyone get it now? Susie, why don't you witness the Jehovah Witness and see how they're going to respond to this? Why don't you excite me, go out there, and share it with them and see how they're going to respond, sister? That's the whole point of you learning this, so you can witness to the witnesses. They'll tell you, yeah, it's Jesus, Susie. They'll say it's Jesus. That was Jesus. But Jesus is the first creature of God. So what? He's been there. He spoke to Abraham. And we don't deny it. That's what they say. You with me there? Well, my debates with JWs have been positive in the sense that I've been able to refute their arguments. But what does that mean? I haven't seen any of them come to faith. Like I said yesterday, I'm going to repeat again. I may be planting the seed or watering the seed that was planted before me, but I have yet to be the one reaping what someone else has sown. In other words, I may be just one in a series of individuals whom God is using to bring that Joe witness to faith. So I'm, I've never been at the end of the chain where after all those years of preparation, I finally meet someone who's ripe for the harvest after witnessing to them coming out of Joe's witnesses. But it doesn't mean that those witnesses that I've shared with won't come to faith. Yeah. Send Leah, this barking, filthy, rabid dog, back to her father. You with me there? So just because I haven't seen them come to faith doesn't mean they won't. I may have been the one planting the seed. You will come and then water it, or you will be the one who reaps what others have sown, or I may have been watering it for someone else. I don't know, but I trust in the Holy Spirit. If I'm faithful to the Holy Spirit, to be used of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will accomplish his will in that witness's life. So I'm not in it for results. Meaning, yes, I want to see people saved. I want everyone to fall in love with Jesus. I don't want anyone to go to hell. But that's not up to me. That's up to the Holy Spirit. I just do my part. It's the Holy Spirit, right, who will use me to do my part and then either bring that person to saving faith or use it as a witness against that person on the day of judgment. In other words, on the day of judgment, the Holy Spirit will say, all these witnesses I sent to you, to refute your objections and show you who God truly was. And you were so stubborn that you didn't accept the witness. So don't complain about what's about to be unleashed on you. Let's go to John 12, 47 and 50 to show you that the word of God will accomplish one of two things. John 12, 47 and 50. Pay attention. John 12, 47, 50. 
The word of God will accomplish one of two things. It will either, either be used of the Holy Spirit to bring you to faith or will be used as a witness against you in order to justify God's judgment of you. Here, John 12, 47 and 50. So you don't take my word for it. Read with me. John 12, 47 and 50. But if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Notice who's going to judge them. Whosoever disregards me, whoever disregards me and does not receive my sayings has one to judge him. The word that I have spoken is what will judge him on the last day. Ah, see, the Holy Spirit will either use your gospel presentation to bring someone to faith or as a witness against that person that no matter how much God went out of his way to show you what the truth was. You still stubbornly refuse the truth, so you deserve the judgment that's about to fall on you. But notice 49 and 50. 49 and 50. For I have not spoken of my own initiative, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment means everlasting life. So whatever I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Side note. If the Father is speaking to the Son and telling the Son what to say, doesn't that mean the Father is using words, words to form sentences to speak to the Son, and those words are not Jesus? You with me there? So you see that you cannot say that Jesus is literally the Word of God if you mean Jesus is the audible voice of the Father that speaks aloud and people hear, and those words that the Father's voice uses to form sentences. That's not Jesus. Because the Father himself speaks to the Son, and the Son speaks to the Father. They have communion with one another. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the Word of God? I explained it. Let me repeat so we don't lose you. I don't lose you. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Word of God? This is what it means. Are you ready? This is what it means. Are you ready? It means that when God wants to make himself known, he does so by sending the Son along with the Holy Spirit to reveal God to us. Jesus is the Word in that he's the one who makes God known to us and he does it by the Spirit, working always with the Spirit. Okay? Okay. Are you catching it? Now, I kept saying, by the Holy Spirit, right? By the Holy Spirit, correct? Let's go to John 14, 26. If anyone's confused, let me know. Then I'll clarify further. Because I want to get into firstborn. John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name, that one will teach you all things and bring back to your minds all the things I told you. Did you catch it? The Holy Spirit will continue the work I've begun among you. When I leave physically, the Holy Spirit will take over and teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said. Now, John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, verses 12 to 13. I still have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them now. You're not able to bear them now. However, when that one comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but what he hears, he will speak. Did you catch it? He's saying the Holy Spirit won't speak on his own initiative. He will simply tell you what he hears. Hears from who? From the Father and the Son. You with me there? The Holy Spirit will speak what he hears. Hears from who? The Father and the Son. So notice what Jesus says. There's so much I want to share with you right now, but you're not ready to understand them. You can't handle them. So when I physically leave, the Spirit will come, and then he will empower you to not only remember the things I told you, but then make known things that you could not handle but now are ready for when he takes over so he's going to give you new revelation but the revelation he gives you 
won't be something he speaks on his own initiative. It's revelation that the Father makes known to me to make known to him. Do you see how it works? Do you see how it works? Send blood of the martyr on his way. Send him back to Chris Lasala's camp so he doesn't come back again. Okay. But everyone with me there? Make sense? So now, if someone tells you, and I hope you've been listening, and I need you to go back and re-listen. If someone tells you, what does it mean that Jesus is the Word of God? Is he literal, literally the voice of God or a word that comes out of God's mouth? Or is it a metaphor? So he's not the word that the Father uses when he speaks audibly, even when he speaks to the Son, but it's a metaphor which denotes the fact that Jesus is the one who makes the Father known. Just like I need to use words and form sentences with my words to make myself known to you, or my identity will be veiled, when the Father wants to make himself known, he sends the Son. And the Son then makes the Father known in union with the Spirit. So he's not literally the Word. It's a metaphorical expression revealing Jesus as the one who makes the Father known to us the spokesperson of the Father. Is he literally the mouthpiece of the Father? The spokesperson of the Father. Yes, Hafsa. Is he literally the mouthpiece of the Father? No, he's not his mouthpiece. Because number one, God doesn't have a physical mouth. He doesn't have physical teeth. He doesn't have a physical tongue or larynx. Right? To give you an apt analogy of it, apt analogy of it, let's go to Exodus 4.16. What does Jehovah say to Moses about Aaron's relationship to Jehovah? Yes, he is the perfect manifestation of the Father's attributes because he's one with the Father in essence, and he's just as much God as the Father is. So is the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an apt analogy with Moses and Aaron's relationship. Exodus 4.16. Here. Here's the beautiful analogy. Let us see if you get it. Exodus 4.16. Jehovah speaking to Moses about Aaron. Jehovah speaking to Moses about Aaron, his brother. He, Aaron, will speak for you to the people, and he will be your spokesman, and you will serve as God to him. Now, here's what the, the New World Translation did. It didn't give you the literal Hebrew words. It gave you the meaning. That's not what it literally says. Let's switch to the King James. Let's switch to the King James. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. Do you see what he said? God says Aaron will be in the place of your mouth. He'll be your mouth. And you'll be the place of God. You'll be God to him. This is an apt analogy. How can Aaron be Moses' mouth? And how can Moses, Moses be Aaron's God? You catch it? That's what the Hebrew literally says. The New World Translation paraphrased it. Did you catch it? Exodus 4.16, the literal translation? Apt analogy. God says to Moses, because Moses was saying, look, I have a speed imped impediment. I can't speak. I can't go to Pharaoh and speak. He goes, guess what then? Moses will be your spokesperson. M I'm sorry, Aaron will be your spokesperson. Holy Spirit, protect me from Aaron. Because Aaron will be as your mouth to Pharaoh, and you will be as God to, Mo uh, to Aaron. In other words, you will tell Aaron everything I tell you, and then Aaron will communicate everything you tell him to Pharaoh, but is Aaron actually Moses' mouth? Do you see it, Exodus 4.16? The King James gets it right because it's giving you the literal meaning. The newer translation gave you the paraphrase.
Is it sinking in or no? Who's not getting it? Everyone got it? Anyone confused? So do you see, just like Aaron is not literally Moses' mouth, and Moses isn't literally Aaron's God, Jesus is not literally the word of the Father. What it means for Aaron to be Moses' mouth is that he will speak on Moses' behalf, representing Moses and communicating what Moses wants Aaron to say. That's what it means for Jesus to be the word of God the Father. Right? Making sense now? That's what it means for Jesus to be the wisdom of God. What does it mean that Jesus is God's wisdom? Let's look at the passage, 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and verse 30. Hopefully by the grace of the chime God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you now understand what these titles mean. So please, my brothers and my sisters, for the love of Jesus, do me a favor. Make sure you listen to these sessions over and over again until you perfectly understand them and teach others. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now notice, it says Jesus is our wisdom, He's our righteousness, he's our sanctification, he's our redemption, as he's the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, is Jesus literally my wisdom? Is he literally my sanctification? Is he literally my righteousness? No more than he's literally the wisdom of God and the power of God. You catch it there? Yeah, you can use the Joe Witness Bible, Protestant. Stick with the Joe Witness Bible. You catch it? Is it making sense or no? Okay, so what does it mean that he's my wisdom? Jesus reveals the wisdom of God to me. What does it mean that he's my sanctification? Jesus is the one who makes me holy. What does it mean that Jesus is my righteousness? Jesus is the one who justifies me. So what does it mean that he's the wisdom of God? Jesus reveals God's wisdom to us. He's not literally the attribute of wisdom. He's not literally God's attribute. He is the conduit through which God makes his wisdom known to us. If you want to know the wisdom of God, the wisdom that guides you to living a life pleasing to him, you need to come to Jesus because he's the revealer of that wisdom. If you want to know how God saves you, and if you want to see the power of God that saves you, look to Jesus on the cross because it's the death of Christ that saves you. Making sense or no? No, it's not, Mar Marshall Villager. All it takes is prayerful, meditative study to understand that if the wisdom of God is an attribute, and Jesus is a person, then he can't literally be an attribute of God the Father. Common sense. Right? Okay, now, Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. Susie, that's irrelevant, my discussion, what they believe in. Let's focus on the uh, discussion. Don't bring in irrelevant issues, sister. I know you mean well. Okay. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. This is so that their hearts may be comforted and that they may be harmoniously joined together in love and may have all the riches. Tayyib, I like that. Tayyib. That result from the full assurance of their understanding in order to gain an accurate knowledge of the sacred secret of God. Notice, gain an accurate knowledge of God's mystery that's now revealed. And that mystery that's now revealed, namely Christ, carefully concealed in him are all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. Do you catch it? It doesn't literally mean that wisdom and knowledge are literally in Jesus. Like Jesus is a treasure chest that you open up and you see wisdom and knowledge like gold and silver in a treasure chest. What does this mean? 
You want to know the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God? You come to Christ. Because Christ being one with the Father essence, being omniscient, being omnipotent, whatever the Father is in respect to deity, Jesus is because he's one with the Father. He is able to communicate the infinite wisdom and knowledge of the Father because like the Father, he's omniscient. And it's through the Son that God's wisdom and knowledge is revealed. Did that make sense? God use you mightily, friends. If you understand now what it means for Jesus to be the wisdom of God, the word of God, then you won't make the confusion of assuming that Jesus is God's attribute. He is God's wisdom in that he reveals the infinite wisdom of God because like the Father, he happens to be God in essence and therefore omniscient. He is the word of God in that he's the one who perfectly reveals what God is and who God is because again, like the Father, he is God Almighty and therefore infinitely qualified to perfectly make known who and what God is. Clear or no? Do we understand now what it means for Jesus to be the word of God and the wisdom of God? So don't be confused when there are passages that say God's wisdom is in Christ. But I thought he is the wisdom of God. How can God's wisdom be in him, meaning revealed through him? Because he's not literally God's attribute of wisdom. He's wisdom of God in that when God wants to make his wisdom known to us, how to be wise in his sight and give us knowledge, how to live a life pleasing to him, he does so through Jesus. Okay. I'm almost done. Okay. 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 You with me there? Exactly. That's like when Jesus called the arm of Jehovah. He's not literally Jehovah's arm because Jehovah is not a physical being. Arm is a metaphor, meaning Jesus is the agent of the Father who brings about God's salvation, something that only God can do, which is why Jesus does it, because he's God in essence and therefore all-powerful. Right? Do we get it, guys? Or we didn't get it? Am I boring you with this stuff? Because you notice I'm not too loud today because I can't be, right? Clear? Okay, so if it's clear, I'm going to briefly touch upon what it means for Jesus to be the firstborn, and then I'm going to do a part three tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to do a part three tomorrow. Now let's go back to see what it means for Jesus Christ to be the firstborn. Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Okay. I'm going to just unpack the range of meanings for firstborn, and Lord willing, we'll do a part three. Okay. The word firstborn in the Bible can have three meanings. Are you with me? The word firstborn in the Bible can have three meanings. Following me? You ready for the three definitions of the term firstborn? Bechor in Hebrew, prototokos, protarakas, prototokos in Greek. For those who speak Assyrian, bukhra. Here are the three meanings. It can mean the one born first, the heir, the one who's preeminent, who holds preeminence, who has a superior position because he's preeminent over the rest of the family members. Okay, so firstborn can mean the one born first. And if you are the firstborn, you're the heir. You're the heir of the father. That's why you get a double portion. And because you're the firstborn, 
not only are you heir, but you're preeminent, meaning you hold supreme status, supreme position of authority over the rest of the family members, subject only to the father. With me there? Now, have you got the three definitions? Did you get the three definitions? Now, not all three definitions will be applicable every time the word firstborn appears. In other words, firstborn doesn't always have three, all three definitions. Sometimes firstborn can mean the one born first. Sometimes it refers to someone who's not born first, but he's the heir and has supreme status and position. In other words, I'm going to show you now from Scripture that the term firstborn doesn't always have all three meanings. The context will determine which meaning <clears throat> is applicable. Which meaning is applicable? Are you ready? First of all, let me prove to you that the firstborn is the heir. If you're the firstborn, you're the heir. Are you ready? No, not like Isaac. Isaac is nowhere said to be the firstborn. He's said to be Yahid, Yahid, Monogenes in the Greek, Monogenes, Monogenes. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy 21, verses 15 to 17. Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. If you're the firstborn, you're the heir. Read with me. If a man has two wives and he loves one more than the other, literally it says if he hates one and loves the other, and both born sons to him, and the firstborn son belongs to the unloved one, the one he hates. On the day that he gives his inheritance to his sons, he will not be allowed to treat the sons of the loved one as his firstborn at the expense of the son of the unloved one, who is the actual firstborn. He should recognize as the firstborn the unloved one's son by giving him the double portion of everything he has, for that one is the beginning of his procreative power. Now understand, the rights of the firstborn's position belongs to him. Understand what it just said. I got two wives. I love one more than the other. The one I don't love as much gave birth to my firstborn. Just because I don't love her as much doesn't mean I neglect my firstborn son. If he's the first one born, I recognize his status by giving him a double portion of my inheritance because he's my heir. It doesn't matter who mothered him. You caught it? So the firstborn is the heir and gets a double portion. So here's one definition. The one born first and the second definition, who's the heir? Okay. Let's go to First Chronicles. But no, before we do that. Okay, before we do that. If you read Genesis, Jacob's firstborn son was Reuben. Okay. Firstborn son was Reuben. Uh, daily gripe. Don't get too excited trying to pontificate to impress us with your knowledge. Sit back and relax. Because it gets a little more technical than simply saying the Hati clause. I know you're trying to impress me with Greek. You're not. Sit back. Don't be a cheap brother. Be an Indian. Okay. He's trying to impress me. Hati clause. See, Hati explains. No, it doesn't. If I get you a sharp Joe witness like Greg Stafford, he'll eat you up for breakfast. Just be a little more humble, buddy. Please. Let's come back to the issue. See, this is what happens when you pontificate and distract. Have patience on us all, Lord. Just like I want you to be patient with me with my imperfections, teach me to be patient with my brothers and sisters. They mean well, I know. It's hard. It's hard. Okay. Okay. Coming back. I make a great doctor because I have a lot of patience. Okay. Let's come back to the issue. Let's focus. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn son because Reuben shamed his father. By defiling, defiling <clears throat> the maid of one of his wives, because Reuben slept with the maid of one of Jacob's wives. He lost his status of firstborn. Watch here. Lost his status of firstborn. So Reuben was the firstborn that he was born first, but he lost the status of firstborn, and the status of firstborn was given to Joseph, who was son number 11. So Reuben was the actual firstborn that he was born first, but the status of firstborn, heir, and preeminence was given to Joseph, son number 11. First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. 
First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Watch here. Watch here. Before the rapture, Protestants are going to leave us behind. Before you leave us behind. Guys, read this. Jehovah Witness translation doesn't translate as accurately, but still you get the point. Pay attention here. Guys, pay attention. These are the sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn. So Reuben is the firstborn. He was the firstborn, but because he defiled the bed of his father, his right as firstborn was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. So he was not enrolled genealogically for the right of the firstborn. Wow. Though Judah was superior to his brothers, and from him came the one to be the leader, the right as firstborn belonged to Joseph. Did you see the two different definitions of firstborn? Reuben was the firstborn chronolo chronologically. He was born first. Joseph was the firstborn in status and position. Joseph wasn't born first, but he was still the firstborn in terms of preeminence and inheritance. So you see how the word firstborn doesn't always refer to the one born first. Andrew, that's what I just said if you paid attention. If you read Genesis, Reuben defiled his father's wife's maid. Went into her. Okay. First Chronicles 5, verses 1 to 2. Did you catch how the term firstborn is used in two different senses? Did you guys catch it? Reuben was the firstborn in terms of chronology. He was the one born first. But... Joseph was firstborn in terms of status. Joseph, son number 11, wasn't the one born first, but he was given the status of firstborn in that he was preeminent, supreme over his brothers and the heir. No, it's because God chose Joseph and put it in Jacob's heart to acknowledge Joseph as the firstborn in status. Irene, do you remember the dream? Genesis <clears throat> 37, 5 to 11, Joseph had a dream where his father and mother and 11 brothers bowed to him. And then later when he was exalted as Savior of the world, Lord over the earth, second only to Pharaoh, his brothers came and bowed to him. Because God had designated him as firstborn in status. You with me there? So guys, I don't know if you lost it, if I put you to sleep. Did you understand how in 1 Chronicles 5, verses 1 to 2, the word firstborn is used in two different senses. Reuben was firstborn in that he's born first. But Joseph, who wasn't born first, is firstborn, even though he's not born first, in terms of status, in that he is superior to all his brothers. He's supreme in authority and the heir. So you see how the term firstborn can be applied to someone who isn't born first. And how the term firstborn doesn't always refer to being born first. Firstborn can be used as a status. Did you guys catch it? You guys caught it? All right. Another example. Psalm 89, 19 and 20. I'm going to do part three tomorrow. Psalm 89, verses 19 and 20. Yes, yeah, even though Isaac is not called firstborn, Stacy, he is superior to Ishmael and all the other children of Abraham. So in that sense, he has a status of firstborn that he's preeminent and he's the heir to Abraham, but he's not called firstborn. I'm going to passages where the term firstborn is used explicitly. Okay, Psalm 89, 19 and 20. Pay attention, folks. Psalm 89, 19 and 20. At that time, you spoke in a vision to your loyal ones and said, I have granted strength to a mighty one. I've exalted a chosen one from among the people. I have found David, my servant, with my holy, holy oil, I have anointed him. Did everyone see that Psalm 89 is about David and God's promises to David and God's love for David? Do you see it? Verse 20, David. Everyone see it? Not talking about anyone but David. Okay. Psalm 89, 26 to 27. Psalm 89, 26 to 27. 
Psalm 89, 26 to 27. He will call out to me, speaking of David, guys, speaking of David, God says, David will call out to me. You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And notice 27. And I will place him as firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Okay, number one, David wasn't the firstborn son. He was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. Number two, David wasn't the first king of Israel. Saul was king before him. And at here, God says, I'm going to make David the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So if David wasn't the first king of Israel or the first one born to his family, he's the youngest of eight sons, how can he be the firstborn? What way is he the firstborn? It's right there. 27 tells you. You don't need to guess. You guys got it. It's right there. Read it. And I will place him as firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. He's firstborn in terms of status. He will be supreme. He'll have supremacy, preeminence over everyone. So he's firstborn in status. So do you see clear evidence from scripture that the term firstborn doesn't always mean someone born first? It becomes a title referring to a person's status, position, and the fact that he's the heir. So in what sense is Jesus called firstborn? Let's go to Hebrews 1, verse 2, and then 6. Let's see. Hebrews 1, verse 2, and verse 6. Hebrews 1, verse 2, and, and verse 6. If it's all three, Andrew, you just taught that Jesus is created and that you just destroyed the Trinity. I'm loving you, Andrew. I think you're distracted today. Hebrews 1, verse 2, and 6. Now, at the end of these days, he has spoken to us by means of a son whom he appointed heir of all things, heir of all things, and through whom he made the systems of things. But when again he brings his firstborn into the heaven and earth, he says, let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. So what does it mean for Jesus to be God's firstborn? Did you catch it? It's right there in front of your eyes. Verse 2. But and at the end of these days, he has spoken to us by a son. See, why YM is not paying attention either. So this is what kills me when you guys don't pay attention. I tell you it's right there. Whom he appointed heir of all things. Heir of all things. Status is related, YM, rank. But notice what it says right there in verse 2 and 6. Who's the heir to whom all things belong? The son. So why is he called firstborn? To denote the fact that all creation is his inheritance. Did it sink in? What about in Colossians 1, 15 and 16, which I'll unpack tomorrow? Okay, I'll unpack tomorrow more, but I'm going to give you a foretaste right now. Let's go to Colossians 1, 15 to 16. Colossians 1, 15 to 16. Watch here. We're going to use their perverted Bible, even though the word other is not in it. It's okay. Watch here. Trinity 1, 2, 3, you got it. Trinity got it. He is the image of the invisible God, the first more of all creation. Pay attention. We're using their perverted Bible. They inserted the word other. That's okay. I'll talk about it more tomorrow, God willing. But pay attention. Pay attention. Because by means of him, and as Daily Gripe said, this explains why he's the firstborn. Because by means of him, all things were created. Even though Joe's witness has added other, tomorrow I'll demonstrate other is not in the Greek. But just let's go with it. All things were created in the heavens and the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all our things have been created through him and for him. Ah. Why is he the firstborn? Because all things were created for him. It belongs to him. He's the heir. But then also in verse 18, verse 18 tells you why he's called firstborn. Verse 18. 
And he, Jesus, is the head of the body. He has supreme authority over the body, the congregation, the church. He's the beginning. He's the one who brought in the new creation, the firstborn from the dead, the one who conquered death, has preeminence over death. Why? So that he might become the one who is first in all things. Bam, there you go. Jesus is first in all things, preeminent over everything, supreme over everything, holds supremacy over everything. So all creation was made for him, and he has supremacy over all things. He's superior to all things. He's preeminent over all things. Now let's see how the King James renders it, Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. There you go. Jesus is firstborn of all creation because not only is he the one who created everything, gives life to everything, sustains everything, who exists before everything. He's older than all creation. But everything was created for him so that he is supreme over all things. He's preeminent over all things. He has supremacy over all things. So all things were created for him, and he's superior to all things. So in what way is he firstborn? He is firstborn in that he's the heir of all creation, who's superior to all creation, who's supreme over all creation, because he is the one who created all things, sustains all things, and exists before all things. Yep. Firstborn from the dead is not simply the resurrection, Andrew. Firstborn from the dead means that Jesus is supreme over death because it told you in verse 18, right, Andrew? So that in him, in Christ, he may be preeminent over everything, preeminent over creation, preeminent over death. So he's firstborn of the dead in that he's supreme over death because he's conquered death, right? He's demolished death and he's superior to death. But how did he conquer death? How did he become firstborn over death, meaning preeminent, supreme over death? By rising from the dead. His resurrection shows he conquered death, he's superior to death, and death is beneath him. You with me there? So it's not so much saying firstborn of the dead that he's the first one born out of death. No, no, that's not the meaning. Firstborn over death means, or firstborn from the dead, means he is the one who has conquered death, he's demolished death, who su who's supreme over death, because by rising from the dead, his resurrection was his way of conquering death, destroying death, and bringing death under his feet. So he had to rise from the dead to become superior to it, to be supreme over it. That's how he becomes superior over death. That's how he becomes preeminent over death, holds supremacy over death by conquering it by his resurrection. Is that clear? So notice what definition does not apply. He is not firstborn in that he's the first one born from God, that God brought him into existence and being. That does not apply contextually. He is firstborn in that everything was created for him. He's the heir. And because everything was created for him, and he created everything, and he gives life to everything, and he sustains everything, and he exists before everything, he is supreme over everything. He is superior to all things. He holds supremacy. He transcends everything because he created everything for himself. He owns everything, right? <clears throat> and therefore, he is firstborn. In other words, firstborn of all creation means Jesus transcends all creation, is above all creation, is supreme over all creation, because all creation, subject to him, created by him, sustained by him, belongs to him. John 3, 31. Speaking of Jesus, John 3, 31.
John 3, 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly. John is of the earth, he's earthly. And speak of, of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. There you go. Jesus comes from above, and he's above all. And he's from heaven, and he's above all. He transcends all. He's superior to all. Now let's see how the New World Translation renders John 3, 31. In the New World Translation. So I'm going to pack it more tomorrow, God willing. I'm going to do a part three. Here's the New World Translation of this verse. The one who comes from above is over all others. The one who's from the earth is from the earth and speaks of the things of the earth. The one who comes from heaven is over all others. He is over all. Literally, it's over all. Not others. Literally, it says above all. Everything. He's supreme over everything. So now we see what firstborn means in reference to Jesus. There are three definitions, three definitions of firstborn. The one born first, the heir, the one who's preeminent and superior. The first definition does not apply to Jesus contextually. The other two do. He is the heir because everything exists for him, and he's superior to all creation because he created all things, gives life to all things, sustains all things. He's before all things, and all things exist for him. So only two of the three definitions apply to Jesus. You caught it now? Contextually, exegetically, only two of the three definitions apply to Jesus. The heir who's supreme, not the one born first or brought into existence. Right? Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to do part three tomorrow. So guys, pray I get a... Good phone call. Pray God save me miraculously, miraculously from a corrupt legal system and from a bitter ex-wife who's full of hate and rage. Pray God will tame her, destroy the rage, silence the rage in her, convict her to repent and fear Jesus and stop trying to use a corrupt legal system to punish me. Pray God will protect my daughters and I, bring them to me and provide through me, keep me faithful and holy in love with him and healthy. For the glory of Jesus. Part three tomorrow, right? Pray I get a good report so I don't get more troubled. The blood of Jesus, my shield, our shield, my daughter's shield, sealed by the Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and please save us, Lord, and grant me a good report like you did today. For your glory, I belong to you. Arise, O Lord Jesus, and fight for us. In Jesus' name. See you guys tomorrow, God willing.